I'm going to invite you to take uh, your Bibles or your Bible apps and turn to the, the book of Genesis and to the book of Galatians. You'll be looking at two different passages this morning. And uh, we're going to start off in Genesis 25, and then we're going to be in Galatians chapter 5. If you don't have a Bible with you or a Bible app on your device, then uh, grab one of the Bibles in the pews around you. That's what they are there for. And if you need a Bible, then uh, we'd love for you to take one of those and read it so that you have it. Hey, this is, uh, this is kind of a season of change. You know that. Uh, school's about to be out. Summer's coming. And there's a couple of items of change I just want to remind you about. Uh, first one is one that may have missed your radar, or to others, it's a, it's a huge deal. Uh, Stephanie Schulzkamp has been, has been our uh, Calvary Christian Academy administrator for the last five years. She's done a great job uh, leading the school to excellence and stability, and she is moving with her husband to California. It's always good when they move with their husband, right? And... Uh, so they're moving to California, new day, new opportunities awaiting them, and we so much appreciate the, the ministry she's had in our midst. Uh, and I hate to see her go, but we have uh, hired a new school administrator. Uh, Julie Moronis is going to be our new administrator of Calvary Christian Academy. And Julie, if you don't know her, she's been part of CCA for 12 years as a teacher, and she's excited and stepping into that. So uh, be praying for Calvary Christian Academy as it continues its ministry uh, to our families uh, in this community. Uh, second point point is one that uh, may or may not impact you depending on how often you use Saturday night as a, uh, an option for worship because it's summer, because we know Memorial Day weekend is next weekend and things change in the summer in Havasu, right? And, you know, people run away and hide or get out of town for a week or a month or whatever. And so um, uh, we're going to have a change in our schedule. It's not going to impact you unless you attend Saturdays. We're going to have one Saturday service at 5 o'clock for the summer. So uh, just keep that in mind. So if you uh, go, hey, i got to miss on Sunday morning, I'm going to go Saturday. It's one service at five. Uh, love for you to, uh, uh, to be a part of that if uh, you need to be or want to be. So just wanted to keep you informed on those things. We are continuing our study of taste and see. We're looking at how we can uh, uh, feed our souls from uh, God's word and from the, the stories about food in the Bible. Uh, have you ever been so hungry that you've done something stupid, you know, where you just like, I don't care how much it costs, I'm going to eat it anyway kind of thing, and then afterwards you went, oh, it costs that much? Uh, 2006, I was in Nigeria on a mission trip, and uh, the food is not good in Nigeria, let me just put it that way, not for me anyway, and so after two weeks of dining uh, basically on rice and peanut butter and jelly and granola bars, we were, you know, dreaming about pizzas and cheeseburgers and stuff like that. And Pastor Chet, who is, um, what's a good word for it? Frugal. Frugal is a good word for it, because cheap is harsh, right? Uh, and um, so Pastor Chet actually said, he goes, toward the end of this trip, he goes, I would pay $50 for a Whopper right now. That's how, that, you know, that's how much, you know, we started thinking about food and, and valuing it. And, and I thought, that's crazy. Until last week in Israel, uh, we had a great trip, by the way, thanks for those who've asked. Uh, last week in Israel, in, in Israel, the food's way better than Nigeria, so tr trust me on that. It's not even a comparison. But the food in Israel is kind of um, uh, bland and, and repetitious. I, I don't know how else to put it. And so we were talking a lot about the foods we missed back home and talking about our menus when we got home and where we we're going to go eat first and all this kind of stuff. And it was towards the end of the trip. We're walking through the part of old Jerusalem, and there's like this little food court area that we hadn't discovered yet. Uh, now that I know where it is, I'll, I'll keep it in mind. But we went to this place, and it was a little burger restaurant that was right there. And it was so fancy that, you know, you ordered at the counter, and they yelled your name when your order was up, right? So, you know, it was a half step above McDonald's. And, and I just ordered a double burger and fries and a drink, and, you know, because I'm not drinking soda, I had to drink their, you know, kind of strange, you know, iced tea that isn't. And so... Uh, so I got that, and, and I paid, you know, you guys pick a number in your head, but uh, I paid $21 for a combo meal. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. You guys are going, seriously? That's crazy. Yeah, it is, but it was the best food I ate the whole time I was there. So, <laughs> so I'm okay with that. Um, you know, overpaying. Our, our menu today has a story about overpaying for a meal. Genesis chapter 25 uh, 
beginning at verse 29. This is a story about Jacob and Esau. If you grew up in church, you're familiar with the story. Uh, Jacob and Esau are Abraham's grandsons. They're twins. Esau was born a couple of minutes before his brother. So Esau is older, but Jacob became the father of the nation of Israel. And this story kind of helps explain why. It says, once when Jacob was cooking stew, Esau came in from the field and he was exhausted. And Esau said to Jacob, let me eat some of that red stew for I am exhausted. Therefore, his name was called Edom, which means red. Jacob said, sell me your birthright now. Esau said, I'm about to die. Of what use is a birthright to me? Jacob said, swear to me now. So Esau swore to him and sold his birthright to Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau bread and lentil stew, and he ate and drank and rose and went his way. Thus Esau despised his birthright. You see, Esau sold his birthright, his purpose, to satisfy his appetite. He sold his birthright to satisfy his appetite. Now, we don't really travel in the realm of birthrights. Uh, That's not a big deal to us anymore. But let me explain what that meant to, uh, to Esau. Because that was a different day, a different culture, a different setting. And and to them, your birthright was the the reality that as the firstborn, you got it all. As the firstborn son of any family, they were the favored one. I know a lot of you firstborns feel like it's still the same way that that in your your family. But inheritance-wise, they actually received it all. They they got all the property. They got all the land. They got all the stuff. They got the, the family identity. And the line of heritage went through them. They were, they were the ones that had all of the, the, the importance, significance in the family. That, that was just the way that the, the world worked at that time. And that's what Esau traded for a bowl of soup. Now, that's crazy. He gave up his identity as the firstborn son. He gave up his purpose of leading the family for stew. Does anyone here think Esau paid too much for a bowl of soup? Let me see your hands. Okay, everybody didn't really respond, so let's try this again. Anyone here think Esau was crazy to make this deal? Okay, thanks. I see your hands. If you didn't raise your hand at all, then see me after the service because I want to sell you some stuff. <laughs> it's really valuable stuff, I'm just saying. But uh, So we look at Esau, we hear the story, and we go, this is, this is idiotic. Who would do that? How in the world could you trade your birthright for just some food? We would never do anything like that. Or would we? You see, as followers of Jesus, as those who believe that Jesus is the Son of God, the Savior of the world, who believe that he died on the cross to pay for our sins and was raised from the dead, and who have made a commitment to follow him with our lives, we have received an identity and a purpose from God. If you will, we've received a birthright. Our identity is sons and daughters of God. Scripture says, to as many as received Jesus, even to those who believed on his name, he gave the right to become children of God. So when you confess Jesus as Lord, you are adopted into God's family. You're part of his family. You're you're a son or a daughter. And and that's why we talk about this identity of being in the family of God. But it doesn't stop there. God also gave us a purpose. He, he, He wants us to be part of his eternal plan to build the kingdom of God. By leading people to a life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ. And so we're engaged in doing that, that purpose that God has given us. And so we, as the followers of Jesus Christ, have a birthright. We're children of God. We have a purpose to grow the kingdom. And every single time that we give in to our appetite, our fleshly desires, we sell our birthright. We do the same thing that Esau did. Because reality is this. We are either appetite-driven or spirit-controlled. Every one of us in this room is either appetite-driven or spirit-controlled. Uh, I ask you to, to turn to Galatians chapter 5, uh, or to mark it. I'm going to ask you to turn there. I want us to walk through part of this passage and just see this battle that takes place in us that is reflected in Esau selling out his birthright. Uh, Galatians chapter 5, the Apostle Paul writes, beginning in verse 16, he says... But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. 
For the desires of the flesh are against the spirit, and the desires of the spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. But if you were led by the spirit, you were not under the law. You see, we have this appetite. What Paul refers to as the flesh that sometimes is called the sin nature that is part of every single one of us. And it's part of us because we're natural born sinners. Right? Adam and Eve, they, they rebelled against God. And when they rebelled against God, then, then they fell. And that sin nature that they stepped into by choice it is kind of imprinted on our souls. It's, it's tainted our bodies. And so we're natural born sinners. You, you see this when you deal with toddlers, right? And, and if you have small children, you know, any, anybody's, you know, toddlers or two or three year olds, any, any of them ever tell a lie? <laughs> any of you have a kid that told a lie? Ne- never, okay. See, a couple of you raise your hands, and others you're going, no, nah, I kid, he's perfect. Yeah, <laughs> sure he is. Just ask your family. Uh, so nobody ever sat down with their, you know, two-year-old and said, okay, son, today I'm going to teach you how to lie, right? But catch them doing something, and what do they do? They just lie. They make up stuff on the spot. You go, who taught you that? Nobody, because we have this natural bent toward, you know, uh, selfishness and toward doing the stuff that we want to do. And, and that's why, you know, oftentimes I just refer to myself as a scum-sucking pig sinner. Because I am one. Because I have this taint in my flesh that you have in yours that draws me towards destructive behavior. It draws me towards sin. that draws me towards rebellion. And even though God has redeemed me, even though God has changed my heart and, and, and put his spirit in me and in you, we still have this desire, this appetite for sin. And, and so we're either going to be appetite driven or we're going to be spirit controlled. And, and that's going to be the reality until the day that God completes our redemption. <laughs> you know what I mean by that, right? When we die and we get rid of these nasty sinful bodies and we get new bodies that are not tainted by sin, that's the completion of our redemption. That's why we think differently about death as followers of Christ. Because we don't have to be afraid of it because it's the completion of our redemption. Now think about this. Your appetite wants to indulge. Right? That's what appetite does. It wants to indulge. And and all of us have an appetite. And, And so if a little is good... More is better, right? Yeah. Everybody knows that. We all know that. If a little bit is good, more is better. It's why I cannot eat a little bit of ice cream. Just confessing. People say all the time, well, just get a smaller bowl. But you can fill it up more times. (laughs) Okay, it doesn't work. I've tried different stuff. You know, instead of buying a half gallon, you know, where you're digging in and loading up the bowl, just get the pint and eat a little bit. Yeah, you know those pints say that they are four servings? <laughs> Have you ever tried to make a pint last four servings? I mean, it's like two bites and you're done, you know? Two bites and you're done, you know? No, a, a pint may say it's four servings, but, you know, uh, you know, you can eat one and go, hey, that was so good, I'll have another. Then you look at the fat content and go, wow, I just ate enough fat to kill a village. My arteries are screaming at me right now. No, my flesh likes it. It wants more of it. Because our appetite wants to indulge, and it's true in so many areas of life. It's true with food, and it's true with alcohol, and it's true with drugs, and sex, and video games, and maybe fitness, or beauty, or or health, or, or whatever it is. Our natural bit, because of sin, is to overindulge, to obsess, to step into that place of addiction. And because appetite wants to indulge, our appetite leads to destruction. Your appetite, my appetite, leads us to destruction. Uh, Continue on in Galatians 5, picking up in verse 19. Paul says, now the works of the flesh are evident. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warn you as I warned you before that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, I read that list and it sounds like a frat house to-do list, doesn't it? Sounds like the channel next weekend, doesn't it? (laughs) Just go down the list, check them off, you got them there. 
You see, our appetite, our flesh will lead us to destruction. It'll lead us to physical destruction. It'll lead us to moral destruction. It'll destroy our relationships. It'll destroy our families. It will destroy our lives if we give it control. Now, it all sounds fun when you're young and naive, doesn't it? And when we say young and naive, what we really mean is young and stupid. Yeah, because young and stupid kind of goes together. You expect it because you don't know any better. Old and stupid, kind of pathetic. But, uh, <laughs> right? I, am I, yeah, because we've... We've, we've crashed and burned enough times that we ought to know better. And, and so, but young and stupid, they, you know, the appetite kind of holds a lot of sway over them because they, you know, they just get out there and go, hey, let's party! Party! <laughs> you just say it like that and your IQ drops 10 points. <laughs> right? Because everybody who's listening goes, you don't know where you're headed. <laughs> yeah, I want to party! Next weekend people are going to show up and Party! Because they're following their appetite. And appetite always leads to sorrow and regret and brokenness. See, our appetite leads to destruction. But the Spirit will give you direction. Proverbs 3, 5 and 6. A lot of you know this. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. And do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him and He will direct you. Your paths. God will direct your paths. You see, God wants to bless you and he will lead you to life if you surrender control to him. Here's how Paul puts it in Galatians 5. Continuing in verse 22. Remember, contrast this with the works of the flesh uh, in verse 19. He says, but the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, Patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. You see, God wants to bless us. He will lead us to life. And as we surrender control to the Holy Spirit, he teaches us how to overcome the destructive appetites. He teaches us how to feast on God's goodness and become people of character. That's what the fruit of the Spirit describes, the character of Jesus Christ. And that's what the Spirit will lead you to as you give Him control of your life. How many of you really want love to be part of your life? Yeah, we do. We crave that. We desire that. We want that. How how many of us really want to be people of joy? Really? You want to be people of joy? Great. Some of you need to tell your faces, okay? Um, Isn't it amazing? Churches, you know, where we come in and we sing like, joyful, joyful, we adore thee, and all these songs of praise to God, and we're frowning while we do it. Just doesn't fit, you know? Like, hey, welcome to the church. Really glad you're here. We celebrate joy. You just can't tell. We're kind of like joy ninjas or something. You just can't ever see it. Yeah, we want joy, we want peace, we want patience in our lives, we want faithfulness and gentleness and kindness, all these things. And and here's the thing, God will direct us into that if we will submit to him, if we'll follow him, if we'll yield our lives to him. Because in the end, when we submit to God, we're blessed. We're blessed in our relationships, we're blessed in our morality, we're blessed in our families, we're blessed in our lives beyond what we can imagine. Uh, So let me ask you a question, and this is between you and God, so please don't blurt an answer out. Um, It's probably the question you ought to think about most of the the day and maybe this, this week. Is your life being driven by your appetite or controlled by the Spirit? Is your life being driven by your appetite or controlled by the Spirit of God? See, being Spirit led means that we choose to submit daily to God's direction. So being led by the Spirit means you wake up in the morning and you say, okay, God, I I want to live your way today. I want to honor you today. I want to submit to you. Help me to, to, to be a blessing to this world in your name. Being Spirit led means hearing God's will by reading the Bible. You guys may have noticed we really encourage Bible reading around here. Not just that you come to church and, and hear it taught, but you read it on your own so that you can hear God speak to you uh, each and every day. Being spirit-led means talking to God. 
That's what we call prayer. Having a conversation with God, an ongoing conversation where, where you know, you're communicating your needs, your hurts, your joys, your, your, your thoughts, and you're listening to God. Being spirit-led means fasting. Wow, fasting. That may have surprised some of you. Do you realize that Jesus said when you fast? He didn't say if you fast. He said when. And yet I grew up in church and I never, ever heard a sermon about fasting. I was never encouraged or taught to fast. But you know what fasting actually is? Fasting is denying your physical appetite. Right? God gave you your appetite. You know, it's good. We could eat from every tree of the garden before sin, except for one. So, so the appetite is, is, is good, but fasting helps us practice saying no to our physical appetite for food. And why does God want us to do that? Part of the reason is so that we can say no to the appetites that want to destroy us. It's practice at saying no to the appetite. It's, it's practicing that so that we can honor Christ with our lives. And, and if you've never tried fasting, maybe you should try it. Maybe just start off with a meal. Just fast one meal, give it to God, practice denying your appetite. Maybe get to a day, whatever, but, but it's part of that being spirit-led. Being spirit-led means accountability. That, that we open up our lives, we're honest and transparent enough with someone or a group of someones so that they know us and we know them and they can speak truth into our life to correct us when we start heading down the road of destruction, when we start giving in to our appetites. That's why we encourage life groups here at Calvary. I don't know you well enough to hold you accountable. We don't have that close of a relationship, at least not with most of you. But if you're in a life group, you have that kind of relationship with people. And they see your life, and they can kind of say, hey, you seem like you're drifting. And they can encourage you to walk with God. Those are some of the things that, that are identified by a spirit-led life. And I was looking at that, and I realized as I, as I wrote that list out that it sounds a lot like the Taste and See Challenge, doesn't it? See, a couple weeks ago, we challenged you. When we kicked off the series, Taste and See, 36 days. What do we ask you to do? Read the Bible one chapter a day. They're still in the bulletin, by the way. In case you lost your list, you can continue on. If you haven't been doing this, guess what? You can start today. Say, God, I want to hear from you, and I'm going to pick up this list, and I'm going to start reading a chapter a day. We ask you to pray every day with your, your spouse and with your kids out loud so they can hear you. To bless them. And we said, hey, why don't you serve in a new way or sacrifice something meaningful to God? Kind of fasting from something. So that was the challenge. Why? Because we want to help you practice this journey of being spirit-led rather than appetite-driven. We want to, we want to introduce you to that, that, that habit in your life. So again, what's controlling your life? Is it your appetite, your flesh? Or is it the Spirit of God? Who do you want controlling your life? You need to choose well because here's reality. Your appetite will sell you out. Jesus has bought you back. Your appetite will sell you out. But Jesus has bought you back. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20 says, You are not your own for you were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. Don't you love that? We, we don't own ourselves. Jesus bought us with his blood. So we, we are to glorify God in our bodies. Uh, the deal is pretty much set. Uh, if you follow your appetite, you will sell your birthright over and over and over again. It just is going to happen. Uh, think about this. We... We hunger for love and intimacy. We already talked about that. I said, how many want love in their life? Everyone raise their hand. We hunger for love and intimacy. And yet when we follow our appetite, we sell out for affection and pleasure. Or just not being alone. We crave purpose in life. And yet we sell out for money and possessions and the illusion of power and control. We are starving for joy, and yet we sell out for temporary fun that numbs our senses and often leads us to regret. We crave significance. We really hunger to make a difference in this world, and yet we sell out for entertainment. Do you realize that we are seeing an entire generation of men who would rather play video games or watch porn than impact their world? 
And some of them are not so young. It's tragic. You see, our appetites will sell us out. Our appetites have sold us out. We know that. We've tasted the bitterness and and, and knowing that we paid too much. But Jesus bought us back with his blood, by his death and resurrection. We no longer have to live as slaves to our appetite. See, that's what he did. He set us free. So we can throw off those heavy chains. We can know the glory of wiping away every stain because we are forgiven through Jesus Christ. And some of you are sitting here today who know what it is for the destruction of your appetite, but you also know what it is to be set free from that. And you are living in the victory of saying, hey, I used to, but I no longer am a slave to this. And we praise God with you for that. But there's others of you who are sitting here and you are trapped in a lifestyle of slavery by your appetite. It owns you. And you are filled with guilt and with shame and and secrecy because you don't want anyone to know that once again you've stumbled and fallen and, and, and you've repented and you've stumbled and fallen and you've repented and you did it again. And you keep making promises to God that you haven't been able to keep. And and, and you're so ashamed and you feel so guilty and you think that God must be angry at you. But Jesus paid the price for your forgiveness. And he's not angry at you. He wants to set you free. He loves you and he wants to bless you. But that means that you've got to yield control to him. You've got to choose him over your appetite. So today, are you going to honor Christ? Because we have a second chance. We serve a God of second chances. He is so awesome that way. So are we going to honor Christ? Are we going to live our identity as sons and daughters of God? Are we going to fulfill the purpose that God has given us? Or are we going to buy stew? Are we just going to sell out our birthright again? See, the amazing thing is, The choice is yours and mine to make. Will you pray with me? Father, today we acknowledge your goodness and your grace. Because you see us, you see our lives, you see how often we are trapped by our appetites. And Lord, today I pray that, that you would meet us here. You would speak to every person, whether to affirm their their victory or whether to call them to just give up that appetite and surrender to you. And Father, help us not to be afraid of admitting our weaknesses. Help us not to be afraid of that accountability that encourages. But let us step into the light of grace. And let us know your love deeply in our hearts. That we might choose today to honor you. That we might choose our birthright over our appetite. God, we praise you because you're always ready to forgive. You're always ready to pick us up and you're always ready to give us another chance. For that, we love you and we declare our love for you in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together and let's worship our God.